Good day to all and welcome to our seminar. My name is Eudun Lem and I'm a deputy director in the fisheries and aquaculture division of FIO. Today's webinar presents the main findings of the first component in a comprehensive study on fishing access arrangements from an economic angle with the objective to facilitate identification of opportunities to enhance trade in fisheries related services, particularly for developing countries. And the report associated with this study will be published at the beginning of next year. The study focusing on fishing access arrangement involving coastal developing countries, including small island developing states. It aims to identify the main characteristics of these arrangements from a social economic perspective by mapping them to facilitate the understanding of their multiple dimensions. And the study was carried out by Professor Liam Campling, who is together with us today, together with a global team of fisheries experts. And the study presented today describes the commonalities, but also differences among the various fishing access arrangements and with a regional focus, considering local specificities and maps the most frequent arrangements used by the major distant water fishing states and distant water fleets. In the next phase, we will plan, we plan to develop and add new components, focusing on supplementary aspects in order to provide a more comprehensive overview of such access arrangements. And it's our conviction that this study will allow countries to better understand the global situation of access arrangements. And this can foster national development in activities that are complementary to the activities associated with fishing access arrangements in general. And such a study, of course, can also promote a more inclusive economic growth in coastal countries with positive results on income distribution and in reducing poverty and hunger. The study is also directly relevant for several of the targets under SDG 14, including uh, SDG 14.7.1 on the contribution of fisheries to the GNP of SIDS and other developing states. Finally, FAO is developing this study under the auspices of the Globefish Project, a multi-donor funded project focusing on sharing information on markets and trade in fisheries and aquaculture products in order to foster the participation of countries, in particular developing countries in global trade and markets. At the end of the event today, the summary of the first component of the study will be available on the Globefish website. With that, I thank you. And I now give the floor to the author of the study, Professor Liam Camping. Liam, please. Uh, greetings, everybody. Um, I will try to share my screen and hopefully that works fine. So you should be able to see that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, can you see that? Okay. Just, just let me know. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So my name is Liam. Um, I, I teach uh, international business and development at Queen Mary University of London, and I'm presenting this piece of work, but it's very much a collaborative effort as you will see uh, very soon. So, this was a study that was commissioned uh, to map access arrangements. Now, as a lot of you probably are aware, access arrangements are very often uh, are quite unknown. Uh, for example, in a personal anecdote, when I was starting out my PhD research, uh, an old hand of fisheries research said to me that getting hold of access agreements uh, was a little bit like getting hold of the Holy Grail. And, you know, it, it genuinely is very difficult to study this area. So I would like to thank FAO for asking me and the team of people that we work with to do this work. Um, but of course, it's very incomplete and very partial. Um, so I thought it would be useful to start off by talking about the, the approach that we take uh, with the work. The reason why I want to talk about this is to be completely transparent, but also to give you an indication of the kind of the different types of emphases that we uh, make or take in analysing the different uh, kind of country and regional case studies. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. So to start off with, um, we focused very much uh, on a desk study. Um, this was a, quite a small piece of work, but it ended up being quite long. Um, we used a sequence of case studies, uh, both of countries and regions, by major distant water fishing fleets and by major access uh, recipients. So in other words, resource holding firms, resource holding states. 
And a lot of this work drew from our individual research and our, our individual kind of experience in interviewing and, and kind of country-based uh, uh, work. So we tried to capitalize on the, the very uneven access to information, which I set out at the outset, by really trying to highlight the different access, aspects of access in the various cases. And I'll highlight some of those in a minute. But to set up the work, uh, myself and the kind of lead co-author Elizabeth Haddis uh, developed a sequence of kind of key conceptual tools by which to help guide the team in their, in their analysis. And what we wanted to do was get beyond the kind of the classic understanding of access as being a government to government relation, um, as is kind of typical with the EU uh, the types of access agreements, and to look at the broader kind of the entire range of different types of access which very often uh, involve firms at the centre. So we wanted this to be not a state-centred analysis, but to think about the economic key economic agency of, of companies. Now, in this work, we are focusing exclusively on distant water access arrangements, um, and I'll come into how we're thinking about that in a moment. So, it, it, yeah. So before I come to that, just a quick note on the co-authors. So I said it was a collaborative piece of work, and, and here you can see the list of people that contributed to the work and the various areas by which they uh, kind of specialised in the report itself. It's quite a long report. Um, it dives into some considerable detail in some cases, but and it, I, as, a, as a whole, overall, the intention is to provide a snapshot, comparative snapshot, to allow readers to get a real sense of the complexity and diversity of forms of access arrangements um, in, in the world. So here you can see a figure uh, drawn by Dan Hetherington and um, what this tries to do is to give a sense of the very, very varied uh, kind of concerns or interests that coastal states have in relation to access arrangements. Now, access arrangements can be reciprocal. So, for example, uh, the classic example would be something like the EU-Norway type of arrangement, or they can be non-reciprocal. And, and the focus here is really on the non-reciprocal arrangements, what the European Union calls the southern arrangements, and by that they mean the global south. Um, and really the focus here is on how developing uh, developed country, but not only, also developing country, uh, governments and or firms seek and gain access to for most mostly developing country uh, resources in their exclusive economic zones. And we categorise this in two different general ways. Uh, the first is the, the, what we call the classic uh, cash for access agreements. And these are, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, kind of typified by the European Union kind of example or government to government. But there are also less well understood uh, relationships uh, here, such as industry association to government, and as we'll see, Japan is a key example there of that model, or company to government, an entirely private uh, company uh, maintains an access agreement with a uh, coastal state. Now, these are very much cash for access agreements. Very often there is uh, another component uh, included here, for example, in overseas development assistance in the government to government, or technical support sometimes in the industry associations of government, but they're quite straightforward in the scheme of things. The other major type is what we call the second generation uh, uh, kind of access arrangements. And what we mean by this is a coastal state giving discounts in, uh, in, in return, uh, discounts in discounted access to the resource in return for the domestication of boats and or uh, onshore investment. So for example, a coastal state will say, well, if you uh, bring your boats and register them domestically, uh, uh, then we'll give you a, a discounted uh, access fee. And why do they do that? Well, because one of the major benefits of having a, a major foreign operator in a, an economy is the economic activity that's generated by that fleet in the port, as like port services, for example, as you can see in the image here, or uh, in, uh, Kind of quite well known, I suppose, is the, is the return uh, uh, of onshore investment um, very often to generate uh, onshore employment in countries that have very often have extremely high levels of unemployment or underemployment. So the the, the developmental component of of second generation access is, is very very much at the heart um, of the motivations of coastal states. 
So the findings. Now, this will be very much a snapshot overview of a series of case studies. And so bear with me uh, and hopefully you'll read the report and go into the detail uh, uh, there. But the report's broken down into two sections. Uh, the first section sets out the resource seekers and the second section set, sets out the resource holders. Now, of course, there are many more resource seekers and resource holders than we were able to cover in this report. So as a result, it will inevitably be partial, but we do hope that we, do hope that we have captured some of the, the major ones at least. And so we start off the report by looking at Japan. Why? Because it's historically, well, the most important distant water fishing uh, nation uh, from before World War II. And it sets the global scene. So it's kind of post-World War II uh, arrangements uh, were driven by strong industry associations, uh, negotiating uh, with coastal states. Um, and, you know, of course, this was primarily kicked off in the 1970s, but Japan has had access has always played a major role in its international relations. And in, in many ways, it still does today, uh, partly through the role of decoupled overseas development assistance uh, connecting uh, resource holding states with, with the Japanese, uh, with Japan. Another major example, which everyone knows quite a lot about, uh, is the EU and, and why do they know about it? Well, because the subsidies are public, they're scrutinised, they're transparent in a network of uh, sustainable fisheries partnership agreements. Um, but one of the things we highlight in the report is the rise of alternative forms of access by private entities who are based in the EU and that includes things like uh, chartering arrangements and, and, other, and other forms of second generation access. The EU case is important, um, especially in uh, Africa, uh, both the North and Sub-Saharan, uh, because it's a very strong relationship to trade relations and, and market access. So there's a kind of a deep embedded uh, 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 relationship of raw material supply from the EU fleet uh, to uh, uh, domestic processes in, in many Sub-Saharan African and African economies. As everybody knows, China has uh, emerged as a major maritime player uh, and, and fisheries have been uh, a key aspect of this maritime expansion. Um, fisheries are not just about the fish, uh, catching the fish. Fisheries are also about the industrial activity on shore, as is the case for many uh, economies, including historically Japan and the EU. And by that, I mean the, the, the procurement of uh, volumes of raw material for domestic processing in China. Now, China is a major user of uh, second generation access arrangements. And uh, there have been a number of studies uh, that looked at the way that um, access has been supported uh, by decoupled loans. In other words, loans that are not directly related uh, to the access agreement, but have uh, uh, some kind of ties. Taiwan has emerged uh, in the 1970s as a raw material specialist. Uh, so it really revolutionized, revolutionized global uh, the distant water fishing kind of model by focusing on transshipment kind of approach and it has a real global reach. As a result, it's also a major flag of convenience operator, uh, uses vessel registries in lots of locations. Uh, but uh, like many of the countries here, including China, it's implemented a wide range of uh, regulation uh, to try and uh, better, to better control uh, flag of convenience operators. South Korea um, was quite similar to Taiwan, uh, although it's reduced its geographical uh, scope in recent years to primarily Russia and the Western Central Pacific. The big difference between South Korea and Taiwan is that South Korean access arrangements tend to be uh, uh, shaped by vertically integrated companies or the Chaebols. But both, com but both countries' uh, entities use uh, uh, industry associations to negotiate and, and they're very much of the first generation kind of approach. Now, the USA uh, has a multilateral access agreement. So this is a, a kind of government to government agreement in the Western Central Pacific. And within that, it uses has both kind of old, its old fleet and its new fleet. So its old fleet is uh, uh, boats owned and operated in the United States. And its new fleet tends to uh, be uh, operators who have investments from overseas and tend to be more oriented to transshipment operations. Now, as a whole, the 
the US uh, tuna fleet has been in decline in, in recent years, and so we would expect to see perhaps less significant access arrangements by this country. And then finally, we, we talk about the Philippines. Uh, why? Because it's another model. Uh, the Philippines uses fisheries very much as an industrial strategy, again, like the China case, in order to uh, capture raw material, to bring it to uh, major uh, domestic uh, processes. And unlike some of the other uh, entities mentioned here, it has a, a sub-regional focus. So it's primarily uh, focused on the Western Central Pacific, or solely, I think. So moving to the resource holders. So we look at West Africa. Um, one of the complexities of this uh, coastal area is that there are multiple distant water fleets there. Uh, but unfortunately, there has been relatively limited cooperation. Now, there is lots of potential for cooperation. There are lots of institutional forms of cooperation. But in terms of its operationalization, uh, this is yet to bear fruit. One of the other big problems in the West African case is uh, historical conflicts with local fishers. Namibia was a key case that we focused in on uh, because it had a strong success story of domestication. So in other words, foreign fleets uh, uh, engaging in second generation uh, types of access. But these have had very well known uh, operational problems in recent years, which have uh, caused all kinds of, kind of political problems uh, because of uh, uh, beliefs that there are nefarious practices ongoing, or were at least. In the Western Indian Ocean, uh, this area, from the Persane perspective, the tuna perspective, is very much a EU sphere of influence, and there are competing coastal states. There have been some attempts to uh, engage in forms of South-South cooperation there, and they're ongoing. Um, but the coastal states there are also competing against each other for market access and raw materials uh, with the, to the EU market. So as a result of this, uh, it, it, it sometimes impedes the forms of uh, regional cooperation that we will see in a moment uh, uh, take place in other small island developing state contexts. We looked at Myanmar as a case study uh, because it has had a long history of macro regional competition in Southeast Asia and a history also of illegal uh, access to its waters. And we saw that as being an important case study to include because it's a way of gaining access uh, to resource that is, is, is illicit. And so this is, Myanmar is not alone in this experience. Um, and so we do think this is something that should be highlighted in any analysis of how access works in practice. Um, India was a great case study because it's always been much more oriented towards domestic uh, uh, development and domestic uh, fleet development. And so as a result of that, the, the very powerful role of, for example, coastal uh, regions, <clears throat> including coastal small scale fishers, shapes the scope for distant water fleets in ways that is not the case in, in the other kind of examples highlighted here. And then finally, we talk about the Pacific Islands, and this is a great study of a uh, case study of South South cooperation. It shows the potential that uh, coastal states can harness from access arrangements to maximize rent uh, from distant water uh, fishing fleets. And the real kind of success story there has been the Vessel Day Scheme uh, for Persane, and, and that has significantly increased the rent uh, available to the eight uh, parties to the narrow agreement uh, since around 2007. So what you can see here is a very wide range of different approaches to extracting the resource uh, and approaches to trying to govern uh, access to that resource, both in terms of um, capturing more revenue but also in terms of uh, trying to generate more uh, onshore uh, employment or economic activity as a result of domestic interests and also, as in the Pacific Islands case, uh, of kind of sub-regional interests of working together. So some reflections. I think it's very important to recognise that access is a product of economic struggle of, over rent and profit. And so by that we mean when a distant water fleet is trying to uh, gain access uh, to a resource uh, in an EEZ, it is trying to do so at the most profitable basis that it can. 
um, in that process, it could be eating into the rent that could be captured uh, by the coastal state. And so as a result, there is this always this economic uh, struggle uh, between these different agents in access arrangements. But we also do know that it's often highly geopolitical. Um, and this can play a significant role uh, in terms of a sub-regional characteristics of a fishery. So, for example, the, the EU's historical uh, role in the Western Indian Ocean and other more uh, kind of contested areas of, of the marine uh, uh, border, borders and so on, uh, which we won't go into here. I think also what we hoped to highlight is that even though there can be um, calls for different types of best practice in relation to access arrangements, they will always be highly context specific. So the case study of India contrasted, for example, with the case study of the Pacific Islands or, or West Africa, are all such different contexts that they, they shape the, the characteristics of access arrangements. Uh, the firms involved, the states involved, um, uh, both as resource seekers and as resource holders. And so in a way, each context is quite often unique, but there are uh, significant commonalities. And one of the things that we find in this work is that contrary to much of the focus in the study of access uh, over the last 20 odd years, we really do need to be thinking about placing firms at the centre uh, as strategic agents, um, as, as key players in, in shaping outcomes, but also as kind of political agents very often trying to influence their home states, very often punching well above their economic weight in their domestic context because of the political significance of the fishery to a sub-region uh, in the EU case, for example, uh, or, or, or to a cultural kind of context. So, for example, you know, politically, uh, very often uh, certain sub-regions of coastal areas have fisheries at their heart, even if economically uh, they're, they're relatively insignificant. Um, at the same time, I think we should, should be thinking about firms as strategic agents in uh, resource holding uh, firm uh, countries as well. And resource holding countries um, are often very small, uh, with quite small um, uh, state capabilities or limited, relatively limited state capabilities, which means that uh, powerful multinationals can play a significant role in shaping the fisheries policies of particular states. And I think it's important to be cognizant of that. Um, why is it important to be cognizant of that? Because in many cases, um, fisheries access revenue is a significant public asset. And it's a public asset that it can be a major contributor to all kinds of government uh, spending within a country, um, for example, in education, healthcare, and so on. And very often what we've seen uh, in lots of countries is some controversy over discounting that is provided to uh, um, uh, distant water fleets as a result of second generation access. And this discounting can, of course, be very uh, successfully generate onshore employment, which has a, you know, a significant political and social outcome. But one thing we found in this work is the need for uh, countries to recognize exactly uh, what is being discounted and what revenue uh, uh, is being forgone as a result of that. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Liam. Thank you for that. Um, I see we have now more than 110 participants joining us and that is very, very, very good, stimulating. And we have the first um, one in the audience asking for the floor. I see Iceland, uh, former ambassador of Iceland to, to FAO, now back in, 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 in Iceland. Good to see you, Stefan. You have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Lem. Thank you, Erwin. And uh, good to see FAO colleagues again, uh, even from a remote location. Uh, and uh, finally, we have this presentation we've been waiting for about for a while. But uh, to begin with, as a former ambassador, I'd like to 
thank all of you on behalf of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Ministry for Fisheries in Iceland, both to uh, thanks to FAO and the authors of this report, and especially the leader, Liam Kampling, who did this uh, very interesting presentation now. Now, the government of Iceland decided to ask FAO to lead an independent study of the way in which fisheries contracts in diverse contexts take place. And it was agreed to start with phase one of a potentially four phase study. Now, the role of Iceland was to fund the first phase and agree to the terms of reference proposed by FAO. Iceland did not have any input into the draft or final version of the study report. It is the report of the author. Now, we do, however, thank again FAO and the team behind the study for a job well done. And as we have already heard, the report will be public. Now, we also like to inform our partners that Iceland would like to continue with the project and bring the whole study to completion. And just to inform our uh, very big audience that one potentially promising outcome would be the launch of this whole project, a launch of a volunteer, voluntary guidelines about best practice for fisheries contracts between parties. But this is for downstream uh, in the future. But as of now, I would just like to reiterate my thanks and, and hand over to the chair. Thanks, Alan. Thank you very much uh, for your <laughs> kind words and thank you for your support of your personal support and that of Iceland, of course, uh, through the, the process of developing this, this project and this report. And now I, I have the floor, I leave the floor open. Mariana, can you please help me to see if uh, who else has, has raised their, their hands? Has there been some indication earlier? Um. There is one question. I don't, I don't know if you would like to. Yes, there are a few in the, in the question and answer, especially the, the last one uh, from uh, Yang Shuren Zhang, which is, do you consider the role of associations in the analysis and not just on, on firms? They're also very important players in, in the understanding of, the, of, of this uh, the, the, this participant. So maybe Liam, if you can address that. So it's not just the behavior of, of the companies or the um, the, the companies of the, of the countries, but also the associations. Uh, and, and of course, there are some associations, or there are also associations of countries that are very important in the management of of uh, of these arrangements. Uh, Liam, please. Yes, yes. I, I was trying to be very disciplined in in having a twenty minute presentation of a, a, a hundred page report. And so, um, yes, industry associations are absolutely central uh, to multiple uh, access arrangements. So thanks for allowing me to kind of highlight that. In our definition of uh, first generation access arrangements, we, we set out three, one was government to government, uh, one is industry association to uh, government, and the third was kind of private entity or company to government. And the reason why we had that second one there um, is is precisely because of the centrality of industry associations in particular, for example, uh, in the case of Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, um, and others. Um, but those ones spring to mind as very important players in, in relation to this. And the industry associations, of course, pool the, the, the multiple operators together and allow for uh, reduced transaction costs. Uh, but but also uh, better governance very often. And so I think that there's an important role that the industry associations play there. Thank you. Uh, there is one question from Professor Trond Björndal, and it's about the resource rents. And, and uh, Trond asks, um, you mentioned resource rents. Have you looked at the kind of values that are involved in some of these arrangements or agreements? and how they are shared between the partners, or is that for the next phase? Uh, for this piece of work, um, no, we didn't. Uh, but in my own work, uh, we have, yes. And I think that's a fundamental aspect. That was kind of what I was trying to get at in the last slide on the, the distinction between rents and profits. 
And I think that the, the way, of course, that the rent is recorded in the distant water fleets is as a profit. Uh, and, and so I think that's a long technical kind of conversation we could have there. I was also, I think, getting at the relative success of some coastal states in capturing a higher uh, uh, resource rent than other coastal states, depending upon the opportunities that they have to cooperate. Uh, and yeah, we can talk about that for a long time, but that would probably have to do to now because it, it wasn't within the scope of the piece of work. Very good. Very good. Um, there are also a couple of questions regarding uh, nutritional values of, well, versus economic value, which is uh, sort of a and also an interesting angle in, in looking at it. I guess it's whether the resource should be more challenged towards domestic markets for nutritional aspects of the domestic population or whether one should um, allow uh, others to fish the resource, et cetera. And then of course, uh, gain uh, financial income in order to compensate. So I don't know if you've looked at, at that or it's a more generic comment on, on trade in fish and fishery products. Liam. We, we didn't look at that in this study, no, but it is very important. And I think that we need to think about the, what is lost. And this is part of the opportunity cost kind of question and the distinction between, for example, food security, food sovereignty, uh, and other questions like the right to food. So for example, with the right to food, we could be talking about the onshore employment that's generated through uh, a second generation access arrangement, or we could be talking about food sovereignty policies being used to block uh, distant water fishing fleets in order to ensure that there's more fish being caught and, and, and sold domestically. And I think that that's a very wide range of possibilities there uh, that are very much depend upon the, the, the politics of that particular country. Uh, but it's a really important and crucial uh, question, I think. Yeah. Then we have questions on, on two uh, different aspects, which are both very uh, interesting and important. One is on gender, whether gender has been uh, looked at. And then the second one is, if you could say something more about the Vessel Day scheme in the Pacific Islands that probably not everyone are, are familiar with. So the gender dimension and also the, the Vessel Day scheme, please. Yes, so that's a great question on gender. Uh, uh, this, this piece of work did not take a gendered lens, uh, partly because we were trying to map the entirety of global uh, uh, fisheries access arrangements. And as a result of that, there are multiple lenses that we were not able to you know, use. Um, but I do know, uh, and from the work of people working on fisheries and gender, that, that gender plays a crucial role uh, in, as, a, as, a, as a lens to think about what the domestic benefits are of uh, uh, fisheries access arrangements and the different types of fisheries access arrangements. So in some contexts, you see highly feminized workforces uh, uh, processing onshore kind of catch uh, as a result of uh, distant uh, fleets, which has empowered uh, 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 you know, women. I'm thinking about the Fijian case here, where in other cases you see uh, quite different outcomes uh, where essentially women are being super exploited by uh, the, the relationship of the distant water fleet and other investors to that coastal state. So I think that again, the, the, the gendered lens would need to be context specific uh, to, to think about how those outcomes uh, uh, play out. But again, it's a, it's a crucial consideration in thinking about access and fisheries trade in general, much like the food security question before. Um, on, on the VDS, the Vessel Day Scheme, so what the Pacific Islands uh, did, and there was a kind of connected question about how, how we can maximise the, the economic, what was the, what was the question, sorry, uh, how could we maximise the learning from the Vessel Day Scheme in the Pacific Islands and potentially advance further? So to try and answer that at the same time as explaining the Vessel Day Scheme, the image that I used at the end from a paper by myself and Elizabeth Havis compared directly the, the WCPO, the Western Central Pacific uh, EEZs, with those of the Western Indian Ocean. And the difficulty of South-South cooperation in a place like the Western Indian Ocean is because of the much greater proportion of high seas in the total fishery, which makes it much more difficult 
for the coastal states to effectively cooperate. Now, arguably, they, they could have cooperated better. Um, but in the Pacific Islands case, the, in the case of uh, per se and tuna, the, the fish literally swim through um, those EEZs. And because of a long history of effective cooperation amongst those coastal states, uh, they have managed to adopt a kind of musketeers kind of approach of one for all, all for one, uh, which has resulted in um, uh, an, an, an encaptured, I mean, it's a public domain, uh, an increase in the capture of the resource rent from 60 million a year about 10 years ago to around 500 or 600 million a year now. And so it, it's precisely about this contested nature of access that I think is crucial to, under, you know, to, to understand it. Um, it's not just a technical uh, resource rent. There are uh, 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 processes of contestation that I think need to be better recognised in thinking about access. It's not just a flat relationship. I hope that kind of answers the point. You, you, you mentioned um, your PhD and when you started out, started out uh, and the comment on transparency and access to, to information. And, and there was a question here from Alexander Rodriguez in LDAC about uh, transparency in general regarding access agreements. And I don't know if you could say something about that. The difficulties maybe you had in, in, in gaining access to other agreements. And, and of course, there are a number of initiatives now. There's PT, there are others that are aiming for more transparency in, 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 this, uh, in this field. Yeah, I think that one of the, the questions of course the eu has a, a, a very positive approach to its access arrangements and it makes them all public domain and the reason why it does that is because there is um a significant subvention from eu taxpayers to that activity and so to not uh, have uh, put that in the public domain would be difficult from its own domestic kind of governance uh, perspective um, and so I think that from a coastal state perspective, there is the risk that if all access arrangements are in the public domain, then it can more easily uh, suffer at the result of at the hands of a, a well-coordinated set of distant water fishing interests. And so one of the key things that's stopping coastal states from engaging in uh, full transparency is precisely that risk. Like in any negotiation, if information is asymmetries are crucial, as we all know, and if the information is all uh, uh, public domain, uh, then there is the risk for coastal states that they will be out negotiated and they're already very often in a weak position anyway. So I think that's one of the explanations for why uh, transparency is not perhaps as what some people would like to see, if that makes sense. Yeah, there are a couple of more questions. There's one regarding uh, technology, the use of technology, and maybe in these arrangements, including technology that is not the most uh, labor uh, uh, in, in intensive. Um, and then a second issue related to, I guess, control and enforcement, whether you, you look at how effective these are in, in uh, the, the arrangement of fisheries agreements in, in maintaining sustainability uh, para parameters that overfishing does not take place, to put it like that. So enfor enforcement issues and, and control. Okay, well, I could trust on the, techn the technology question um, it, it is also about firm size, right? And I think so, I think that what we see and my personal perspective in a lot of these uh, contexts is that uh, larger uh, uh, corporate entities are able to um, capture more of a slice of the pie um, as they are in all industries. Um, this isn't specific to fisheries at all. Um, and there's a lot of work that's been done, for example, uh, by the World Bank in their most recent uh, kind of world development report in 2020. And this is the same case in the same in fisheries where you see large entities uh, who are able to use their relative market power to capture uh, gains from uh, other entities in the value chain. Um, and this is a, uh, an argument that I've been making with a colleague Elizabeth Havis for some years in relation to the tuna industry. So I do think that uh, firm size matters and kind of corporate strategy and corporate organization. Um, 
I, I, I don't. The role of technology in, in relative labour and capital intensivity of that, I think, is beyond the scope of the access agreements study. And but it's something that I have looked at in terms of the international division of labour in, in, in fisheries processing. But I'll, I'll pass on that because it would take me away from focusing on access. And I'm sorry, the second question I didn't I didn't really get. Well done. Uh, which one? The one on en enforcement or? Yes how fisheries agreement could lead to overfishing, of course, if there are no controls or, or how this is, is monitored. Yes, and well, I, again, that's very context specific. I, I think that there are um, a very wide range of stronger and weaker types of access arrangements. And historically, of course, um, in many contexts, the access arrangements that were implemented were not just about capturing more revenue, they were trying to ensure that the resource is there for generations to come. And what we have seen uh, is in, again, to use the Pacific Island countries as a, as a case study, is that through their effective South-South cooperation, they have also uh, implemented a, a much wider range of sustainability criteria and that's understood in a broad sense uh, than other uh, coastal contexts. Um, and in doing so, um, in the, from a tuna lens, uh, they have, well, again, what, probably the most, what, the, the most sustainable tuna fishery in the world. And, and so access arrangements um, must always have sustainability at the heart. It's the foundation that access arrangements need to be built on. If they're not built on that, then you were talking about destroying, uh, 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 you know, essentially a, a global commons uh, in the interests of short-term revenue gain. And I think that's not in anyone's interests. Thank you. Uh, then we have a couple of questions uh, regarding the, the impact of this agreement on the domestic industry. Uh, and, and one of them is from our old friend, uh, Mario Aguilar in, in, of, of Mexico. And, and he phrases it like this, do access agreements contribute? Are they neutral or do they inhibit the development of domestic fishing fleets for the same species and other fisheries, of course? And that is also very, very interesting. And then, of course, there is a the very sensitive question regarding the role of subsidies here and, and, and how this is treated. Um, and whether there's a methodology to look at and uh, at, the, at the portion of subsidies, I guess, uh, within these the, these payments. But uh... and so I think that access arrangements have to be understood in their specific contexts. Um, and so the, the question there um, is one that it depends. So if you're talking about a, a small island with very limited government revenue that's fiscally squeezed and that has a very significant fishery, then the access arrangement uh, uh, can provide revenue. Whereas if you're talking about a country that has a very diversified economy um, with lots of potential for domestic investors, industrial investors to build their own fleets and to engage in that fishery, then there is the risk that the access agreement could knock them out. So I, I think that that's, that has to be understood on a case by case basis. On, on the question of access and, uh, and, and subsidies, I think one of the key things to understand there is that what I'm trying to encourage people to think beyond with this piece of work is the straight government to government access arrangement kind of logic that has shaped the international community's understanding of what access is for many years. Access is like most other forms of investment uh, in fisheries, also about management. And so how you give out and allocate licenses is also about how a country decides to use its sovereign rights in order to um, enhance or maximize the sustainability of those uh, resources and, and so I, I'd like to kind of emphasize that in, in when we think about uh, uh, fisheries licensing and access as a whole. Okay, um, 
Yes, and then from Aurora Mateos, regarding the UN law of the Sea Convention, as the general framework, which provisions are missing or could have been negotiated in this subject, I guess, in relation to fisheries access agreements. Yes. I, I, I am not fisheries lawyer, and in, in, in this audience, I would be very reluctant to take on that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I saw a comment that maybe Marcio wants to address it very briefly. Marcio? Who is a lawyer? Yeah. Uh, yes, but I'm not going to address that question. But basically, just uh, uh, one issue, Otto and Liam and participants, that was very, uh, uh, since we have received any questions of uh, future phases, I'm going just to summarize what FAO is planning to carry out in the next phases of this study. So as Liam mentioned, this first part was only the mapping of the access agreements of access arrangement. So those are, it's basically a mapping with the basic characteristics of each region framed by social and geopolitical context. Uh, the next three phases that we foresee, uh, it's going to solve many of the questions that we have received. The first, the first phase, the second phase is an economic analysis of the, of the access arrangements. So in those, in those analysis, in addition to the economic side, we are going to include the institutional framework, transparency, uh, possibility, feasibility of local sourcing, resource management, fishing rights, policy operations, et cetera. The second, the third phase, it's going to be the application itself uh, in terms of what are local bottlenecks that create problems for the supply of sometimes services associated to those uh, fishing arrangements. Uh, and, the, and the last phase, it's going to be the interconnectivity with other UN agencies in terms of major topics like IEU, drugs, trafficking, fraud, et cetera. So the, those are the main three pillars that we're planning to conduct in addition to the first one of the mapping. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, uh, Marcio. Now I'd like to give the floor to Don Syme from New Zealand, who has asked for the floor. Don Syme, please. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, really, really interesting presentation and um, a really um, useful piece of work I can see already. Um, been, just wanted to say I've been really happy with your characterization of, of the, the Pacific so far. I, I, think, I think you've raised some good points. Um, um, highlighting how well the Vessel Day Scheme has been working uh, as, a, as quite a unique cooperative um, arrangement. And also the sensitivities around um, release of this, of, of this information um, from coastal states. It, it, is, it is certainly a sensitive issue um, that is context specific. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily the same for Pacific Island coastal nations uh, as it is um, for the EU context necessarily. So that's really, I think you've presented things in a really balanced way. Um, just, just had a question, it was useful, Marcio is talking about the next phase, phases. Um, a lot of the messaging today is around context specificity. And um, when you're thinking about voluntary guidelines at a global level, have you got any initial thoughts about how you would how you would even think about um, global level voluntary guidelines when when this issue is so context specific? Do you have any? I know it's early days, but any any initial thoughts on on how you might manage that? Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, Don. Uh, it's a tough question. Um, uh, Liam, can you can you try? <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my, someone's turned my video off, but um, I. <laughs> That's a very difficult question, and um, oh, there we go. And so, I think that we could start by trying to understand who is doing access, and from there we could start to think about perhaps the from a corporate governance perspective, um, the companies that are engaged uh, having some more transparency as well in how they're doing it, and and 
you could imagine that the companies themselves uh, could be um, asked to be uh, more transparent and perhaps given the fact that they are very often the golden the global, more global players in other words operating in multiple fisheries at the same time um, that would give us a greater sense of their strategies now of course that would also be very commercially uh, uh, sensitive and, and I think that for this to be effective uh, any kind of global uh, arrangements to be effective you would need uh, a core of, of relatively good corporate players uh, to be engaged in the process of negotiation um, <laughs> that's a very tentative beginning of an answer I'm sorry I can't give you more at the moment Okay, thank you. And in, in any case, and any such process within the FAO would have to be, of course, uh, done in a, in a very transparent manner with the full uh, involvement of all the, the, the members, of, of, of course, uh, which also would have to endorse the, the, the final result. And I'm sure it would have to go through the usual mechanism of an expert consultation, technical consultations, maybe in, in, in various steps through possibly one of the, the subcommittees, etc., before it goes to COPE. So it will be a, a long and inclusive process. Do we have more, more questions here? Uh, I don't see any raised hands. Um, let's see if we have some questions. We do have one and two questions, but I think we've answered them already uh, regarding access to, to data. Uh, which you said had been difficult, but at least it's more, it's it's doable compared to how it was uh, in in the past, at least. And of course, as you mentioned, certain uh, countries, organizations like the EU, of course, have a uh, requirement and an obligation to keep these access ag ag agreements because it's public money to keep them uh, in the public domain. Uh, I think you've you've replied to to the others. Um, now, um, I don't know, well, Beatrice Gore is also here, and of course she has been working on these agreements for, for quite some time. I don't know if, if Beatrice Gore, you want to just make a short comment on the, on the social dimension, which of course you have been very much um, involved with in, in the past. Well, so um, our room, uh, I think Ms. Uh, Ms. Jessica Landman wanted to have the, her, um, her hand raised, so I don't know. Who, who sorry? Uh, Jessica Landman. Jessica Landman, yes, please. Yes, my question is that uh, the remark that you made about the uh, about the lessons from the Vessel Day scheme being applicable in places where the fish are mostly found in the EEZs of the countries in question, whether that would be, whether there are any lessons there for the countries of West Africa that you might allude to as they think about cooperation. May I? Uh, yes, please. So I think that there's. I think that the West African context is uh, there's a lot of great potential, uh, and I think that it's not my area at all. So I I, I would defer on understanding the, the, the specific context. But in my basic understanding, uh, there is a lot of great potential for West African coastal states to 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 activate some of the existing sub-regional arrangements more fully. Uh, and institutions uh, and to perhaps learn from the real gains that have been made in, in the Pacific context uh, in terms of capturing more revenue. But of course, a lot of this also connects to some of the other questions that have been asked in, in the chat about how do we um, think about how to measure those gains. And, you know, if it's just government revenue, is that government revenue being hypothecated? I, I, channeled to specific outcomes or is it being lost in the treasury uh, on whatever else um, and I think that that's a really important uh, kind of question that um, that hasn't really been addressed in, in all of the contexts that we've talked about um, where the money goes uh, and then, uh, of course it's, it's up to the democratic or the, 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 the sovereign state to decide that um, but it would be I think uh, more powerful to the arguments of enhancing revenue from access agreements if that revenue were clearly um, uh, hypothecated towards um, yeah, citizens, people that live in that country. 
or industry development or whatever that country decides. But yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do any of the other panelists want to uh, to add something? I don't know if Iceland, you want some final remarks, Stefan, before I, I close. We've answered all, all the questions so far. And of course, we're also available later on for, for questions for those of you who haven't phrased your questions yet. Um, Stefan, you want to, to add something? Uh, just just to to say again, thanks a lot. It's been a very, very interesting discussion and, and uh, good guidance on the way forward. The just one observation as, as the interim chair of the Blue Food Alliance or Aquatic Food Alliance, I have been made more aware of the nutritional factor in this whole debate so thanks again for always adding something new to the debate thanks and and thanks to file for the event thank you well thank you thank you stefan unless there are no one who, who wants to to add some final remarks or additional questions then i'd like to thank all of you for first of all for being here um, for your many good and and well crafted uh, thoughtful questions to Liam, of course, uh, and his team for uh, being in charge of and delivering this very important first phase of, of the project and also for hopefully being, uh, being willing to continue this. Thank you to, to Iceland, of course, for their support during the first phase and their willingness and interest also in the second phase. And also uh, thank you to, to all of you who have contributed to, to making this more more, more interesting and, and, and rewarding. And, and also the final re remark from Stefan re regarding, for example, uh, the nutritional dimension and Meryl Williams about the gender dimension. There are so many things that are relevant that we maybe don't think about in, in, in the very first, uh, our first analysis, which very often deals with the fish and the money, but there are so many other dimensions that are equally important and maybe more important for many of the stakeholders. So with that, I, I thank, you, thank you again, all of you, and I hereby close the meeting and, and thank you, Mariana and, and Marcio for help, helping me realize this event today. So thank you again and, and goodbye. Thank you. thank you. Thank you everyone for joining, thank you.